heartbreaking to know that most of his works aren't played anymore. And that's one of the things, I didn't really expect to find all of this when I started any of this project. I was just interested in the one piece I was working on. And then I found this, and I found that, and then he's got around 13 operas. And then majority of his works are actually vocal work. It's not actually music for the double bass, but he is literally opera obsessed. And literally, when he's not doing opera, writing an opera, he'll be playing opera on the bass. That was just him, yeah. I'm so glad I got connected with today's guest. It was through Leon Bosch, and whenever Leon Bosch makes a recommendation, I sit up and listen. So thank you, Leon, for connecting us. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we're talking today with Stephen Street, who is quite the versatile bassist in the UK, playing jazz and classical music and getting into publishing. And that's why Leon connected us. Stephen has the goal of doing Urtext editions for all of Bottazzini's works. So we talk about that, but much more of course, what the pandemic's been like. How can you not talk about that? Life for him, playing in various orchestras. We know a lot of people in common. That's just how it goes for me with the podcast these days. Definitely check out what he's doing. He's got an awesome website. You can check out his editions there. We've got some of his editions coming into our sheet music store as well, which is very cool. And you can follow him on all the socials. We've got that all linked up in the show notes. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, and Modacity. More on them later. But let's get into this conversation with Stephen Street. Hey! Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Lovely to meet you too. How's it going? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Nice. Wow. I like the. I like your wall art. What is that um, extensive? That is a jazz family tree. Wow. It is bloody How brilliant. cool is that? <laughs> wow. I've never seen that before. I'm gonna have to pick one of those up. That's great. Yeah, it is absolutely brilliant. Literally starts right the way from blues all the way up to. A lot of the current guys at the top. It's it's brilliant. Wow. Well, it's great to meet you. Th- thanks, thanks to Leon for introducing us. We we know a lot of the same people. It sounds like looking looking through what you're up to. Are you are you uh, are you in London right now, or where are you at exactly? I'm down in the south of the UK at the current minute. Oh, okay. I um I okay. stayed in London for six years. That's all. That's how I okay. got to meet Leon. Okay. One of my teachers. Oh, are you are you in are you do you happen to be in Bournemouth right That's now? Me. Or are you okay? Okay, okay. So another person we know in common, uh, David Daly. Yes, <laughs> I have worked with David Daly in the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. So yes, I do know David. Yeah, that's great. I have great memories of him. Uh, he and his wife came out to the West Coast maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and we we got together at one of these old cafes here in San Francisco, Lovely. and so yeah, he's a small great world. Chef. I. I yeah, for sure, for sure. It looks like a lovely part of the country too. That I, I, yeah. Yeah, this is certainly a good place to be during everything that's currently going on. Is you can go get some decent exercise in a nice surrounding area. It's worth it. Nice. Yeah. Well, I, I, at the moment, I wish I was in a situation more like that because I'm right in downtown San Francisco, and big cities are great normally, but it's a little bit of a disaster movie right here. In, no, I completely and... understand, but it's everywhere, so you can't really avoid it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, what? Uh, so I was in the UK almost exactly a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was filming a couple courses for Discover Double Bass up in Leeds. All right. Uh, and it was the cheapest plane ticket I've ever gotten in my life. And I thought, why? Why is it so cheap? And then I thought, oh, Leeds in January or February, maybe, maybe not, not a tourist <laughs> hotspot. No, perhaps not. <laughs> what? What's it like though? Uh, this time of year, is it is it the stereotypical kind of rainy weather, or what's what's it like? It's not too bad. But lucky, there's there's quite a big difference between the north and the south in the UK. Mm-hmm. And also being by the coast, we generally are slightly warmer because the water mm-hmm. keeps the land warmer. So yeah, it's it's probably one of the nicer places to be. We have a little bit of a microclimate down here. We're very lucky. Okay. Okay. It's wow. Yeah, rain. I got a visit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's okay. Um. I yeah. I I felt like such a fool last year. I you know I made that whole trip over to Leeds, and I thought, oh, when I get to the UK, I'm gonna take a couple weeks and go to London and explore. Now I really wish I did that now because we're all locked You'll down. You'll get a chance um, again. Don't worry. I will. Yeah. So I'll get back and I'll make I'll make a proper trip of it and and really explore. Very so hopefully we can meet. Yeah, that that'd be great. Uh, wow. And so, um, and you also studied with Chris West, yep. I believe, right? Both okay. of my teachers <laughs> Another... <laughs> are utter legends. I have to say, they are brilliant. I'm so lucky to have had them. That's great. Mm. That's great. Um, have you always been into into? I'm assuming you're into jazz since you've got this cool family tree. Have you always been into jazz as well? Yes, or... very much so. I've always led a bit of a double life, if I'm honest. 
Mm. Well, actually, mm-hmm. my first routing into music was through bass guitar, mm. and I taught myself that. And it wasn't until I was 18 that I actually started double bass and got a scholarship a couple of years after that to start studying with Chris. But I've always wanted to be employable as possible, and I've always wanted to be a musician, so playing lots of different styles, not just sort of just too much channeled in one, one way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Um, what? Tell me about what I've I've never asked one of Chris's students or one of Leon Bosch's students. Like, what what are they like as teachers? Could, could you just describe their styles? I think that'd be interesting. Yes. Then they, That's a big question. It Sorry. Is, yeah, you can tell by the look on my face. It is a big question. Different, but both brilliant in the sense that Chris knows exactly what buttons to press to sort of get you going to go and send off your own sort of chain of thought. But Leon is just massively inspiring because Chris mm-hmm. West is also, as you probably know, a very regarded mathematician as well as being a bass player. Mm-hmm. And so his approach is methodical and it's very, very well thought out. But Leon's incredibly passionate. Not that Chris is not passionate, but the, Leon's just this really inspiring, really getting you thinking from the, sort of the heart, if you make any sense. He's, they are they both mm-hmm. complemented each other in that way. That's why we were so lucky to have either of them because I had all the great foundations from Chris in terms of all the thumb position technique that I think everybody should learn his thumb position technique. And then mm-hmm. Leon just really fine tuning me as a musician. And yeah, he's a great compliment to each other. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah, Chris West has some sort of San Francisco connection too. I think one of his, his, his in-laws or something like that is the Might conductor for the ballet. Maybe, maybe that's it. Yeah, yeah, it could be his brother. Um, but, but yeah, we worked out. I got an introduction, and so I have some ballet tickets waiting for oh, me. That, that whenever, whenever the ballet starts up again, who knows when that'll be? Yeah, Chris <laughs> is one of those incredibly intelligent people. He can just, he just can do anything. It seems he's one of those people who just has that brain. Is right. I just get to do that now. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how how long were you study? How long were you living in London? So I lived there for six years. I did both an undergraduate and a master's at Trinity Mm Laban, and they were the most supportive, welcoming, opening course, music college, sorry. And I actually did both the jazz course and the classical course side by side. I did effectively two degrees. Is that common or is that uh, for bass players? It's not common, but Mm -hmm. I just auditioned on both and I was offered places on both courses. And I said to them, look, I absolutely love both. Please, can I try and do something of the both together? And so they tried to make something work together. I was predominantly in the classical department because there was more need for me there. But I did as much as I could of everything, basically. I was always pulled left, right and centre for absolutely every project under the sun. <laughs> what's, what's the London jazz? I'm just curious. What's the London jazz scene like? Because, you know, here in the States, um, p- people might have a, a, you know, New York City is a hotbed for jazz for sure. Uh, there are only a few other spots that, I mean, nothing's like New York no, City, uh, you know, uh, in terms of this country, at least. Mm. San Francisco, we've got a couple clubs. We've had this place, Yoshi's, for, for a long time that, you know, people will play at. But otherwise it's it, you run out of venues pretty quick but i'm just always curious like like what what's the scene like it's, that's a very interesting question it's kind of a big question i argue that in the uk there's a much closer focus towards composition and ensembles of your own which you take to different places rather than it being just in a particular event yes we have a few venues and there's many great venues but there's only say four or five which is purely just dedicated to jazz unlike new york where those are everywhere venues have to adapt in the UK to have different things on different nights a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. I'd say the UK jazz scene is incredibly vibrant. It's in some ways, I'd say, underappreciated by some of the people in this country. Mm. But it's a very hard working one. I can definitely say that. There's lots of sort of pockets of it everywhere, if it makes sense. Sure, sure. Yeah. I've got yeah, many no, fond memories. Interesting. <laughs> It, yeah, it's it's so interesting to me how how uh, different different cities uh, across the globe and just different scenes. You know, I was in Melbourne, Australia, year year and change mm. ago, and and talking to Ben Hanlon, who plays in the Melbourne Symphony, but also plays jazz, and he was just r- rattling off these jazz clubs. And I mean, it's it was incredible. I'd to argue me how much... in the UK, the sort of Ronnie Scotts is the main hub of them all, uh, which all mm-hmm. the major artists come over to and they visit and they play at. But there's a few other brilliant venues like the Vortex, the 606, and there's Oliver's Jazz Bar in Greenwich, which is a great little underground bar which supports Trinity Laban. So that's a, there's lots of little places which, and we have jazz in some of the major venues as well. And that's what I mean by venues are adaptable. It's not necessarily always jazz at one place, but they adapt their program depending on what's going on, if that makes sense. 
Oh, yeah, for sure. We've got some of those, too. It'll be like a country band yeah. one night. And here in San Francisco, it'll be like beat poetry one mm. night and then and then jazz a, a couple nights. Uh, I always had such a hard time balancing that orchestral uh, 10 a.m. rehearsal life with like playing, you know, playing till two in the morning yeah. or something like that. I, that... I have exactly the same problem, particularly trying to do two degrees. The, the, the idea was to go to the Ronnie Scott's jam as much as possible because that's where on the the better jams happens and that's going on till three or four in the morning and then i'd have symphony orchestra yep. in the morning like oh, you know 10 a.m start <laughs> <laughs> So, so when did, so Leon, you sent me out of I checked out your website and you're you've been you've got all sorts of editions and you've got this great and gigantic goal of publishing Urtex all all of Bottazzini's work, which is that's something that I think someone who's had an association with Leon Bosch that's like a goal that I think yeah, <laughs> I, he's, I guess he's, I've got that same sort of mentality to him like a, you know he runs all the marathons <laughs> and what have you so it's my sort of like. I must try and do it, if you see what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> well, when did that become an interest of yours? Uh, putting That came through my studies. Idea? And basically, okay. through when I had, didn't have something that I needed, I'd just then create mm -hmm. it myself. As with mm -hmm. all of my projects anyway, I want everything I do to benefit others. That's, that's the bottom line under all of everything that I'm trying to do. But one thing that really stimulated the, the Urtext idea was Capriccio de Bravola. I'd be listening to different recordings and I'd find one bit right down to the boots and then hear another recording, well up in the sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, you just left at the point where you think, what did he actually do? And so the yeah. idea on the ethos behind it is just to bring context to the current editions so that you can decide how you want to play it. There's obviously no problem how you play it because it's just as long as you're getting what you want out of it. It's just to give a sort of context and a setting and understanding what actually happened, then you can decide from that. That's what it came from. After several years of planning, I'm so happy that my course, Beginner's Classical Bass, is out on Discover Double Bass. This course is made up of 66, yes, that's a lot, <laughs> video lessons which cover a wide range of topics on classical double bass starting from taking your bass out of the case which is very fun <laughs> to film and Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass and I have a great blooper reel about that and leading to different bow strokes such as staccato and portato the topics also include posture simple scales and arpeggios left hand technique bowing technique simple pieces which are fun to play practice tips and much more you can learn more through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath this episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contra Bass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. Well, I, I imagine that Bottazzini's music would be particularly confusing because so many editions, they're written in the sounding octave versus that. I, I was talking recently, I haven't put it on the podcast yet, but Tobias Gluckler, who has done a lot of editions over the years of uh, especially some Viennese bass mm -hmm. repertoire. You know, he's done Dittersdorf and Von Hall. Mm -hmm. And I was asking him, like, how does one even approach an urtext? And for him, it's like this years and years process of chewing on these things. Like, how do you even, how do you even start? I mean, maybe we could talk about Bottazzini. Zini, since since we're both bass players, yeah. but like, how how does one put together something in the kind of urtext? Well, sort the of lucky thing with Bottasini is the fact that he was very meticulous with his manuscript. So mm, okay. he would keep a lot of his manuscripts bound in sort of travel catalogs. So he knew that they were his final editions, and there weren't separate bass parts. So he must have played from memory every time. And the other thing is that he always wrote the pitch out at sounding pitch because he was often he was a a genius obviously but he was often thinking from an orchestration point of view in my opinion so mm -hmm. he'd be thinking that frequency needs to relate to that voicing in the piano so that's where it needs to be so in that way a lot 
some of the work is is taken away from us because he's been so meticulous in the way he's kept his records that mm -hmm. you just need to give a representation of that. It's only when people have changed it afterwards that it's become a bit of an issue, if that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Yeah. So so how how does one I'm, I'm I'd be interested in how do you approach something like that? Are you like looking just at the manuscript or do you have another couple editions in front of you when you're kind of referring back and forth? Well, or, yes, how does that, that work? is the case, because when you're trying to learn a piece, you end up getting a few different editions. But mm -hmm. It's through the fact that I've looked at several different editions and not found one the, the same everywhere, if that makes sense, that I had to then go mm -hmm. and look at the manuscript. Because the manuscript, we have to say, is the most important, if you like. It's mm -hmm. a crude way to say it, but that's what it came from. So we have to give priority right. to what that is written. And if nobody's got access to that, then they can't make judgments, if that makes sense. It is is uh, Badazzini, I I'm I, if I remember right, he wrote somewhere around 300 works. I think that's around, what Leon yeah. emailed me. Okay, and there are manuscripts. Uh, are, are how accessible are these manuscripts? Are you are you find, are there like scans available of them online, or do you have to like contact a library? It's or a real mixture because there's a few okay. scores dotted around the world, and there's also different copyright laws on different things. Mm -hmm. So the scores that I've been studying a few from America, and the editions I've been working on so far have been in America. Italy has different moral and what do you call it? ownership copyrights on things. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's all very dictatorial on where the manuscript is kept. Yes, some mm -hmm. websites do have scans available where they can just hand it straight out. Some you actually have to go there yourself and take your photos or look at the manuscript yourself. Wow. But you're, are, are you typically allowed, we don't have to get specific, but are you typically allowed to take photographs if you make arrangements like that and then you can take them home and, yes, and do an edition? Because um, okay. it's in the interest okay. of freedom of information or what have you, but yes, usually. Wow. You're like a, a musical Indiana Jones. I'm trying like, my best. Like, going, going. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So you've done the Bodazzini method That's so right. far? I can show and, you a copy. Yeah. So this was in the British Library. Okay, yep, yep. And so, as many people probably like me, we didn't realise that it was actually an English translation. And mm. so I thought when I found this, crikey, I thought that would be really useful for everybody else to have. So it was a case of me negotiating with the British Library how we can then make an edition of this to be able to show out to the public. And that's what happened. And so every single page was photographed and, and edited to be able to be made into another edition. Wow. Okay. Okay. Interesting. That's one of those methods that I never, I never even knew that he wrote a method. I think when mm. I was growing up, and and I certainly have never, never dug into. I think I have something floating around my iPad yeah. um, that I haven't looked at. But yeah, there's been the French edition <laughs> hanging around on IMSLP for quite a while, but mm -hmm. nobody realised mm -hmm. that all of his text was actually written in English in an English publication. Wow. So it's just a, like a, a sort of a snapshot back into history and how he approached it. It's really interesting. He's very frank with everything he says in there. This is how I like it. But it doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, yeah, he, I've been doing this pandemic it has just given me so much extra time that I've been doing getting really into base research yeah. and I find myself I bought, I bought a bunch of books and I've been reading up on the li the lives and learning a little bit more about Badazzini and it's 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 interesting to uh um, it snowballs. You start with one yeah. thing and then you're like, "Oh, that's interesting." Then you go and look up something else yeah. and it's like, "Oh, that's really cool as well." Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's so funny because he he seemed to from what I read he really wanted to make that move into being a composer first I, I think but he was kind of like he was like too good at bass for his own good and and the money came so easily from the bass it sounds like it's I, I'm I hope I'm remembering this correctly but I don't think I think he made a lot of money I think he was also fairly bad with money so he was always he was very running generous. Out of money. There's, okay, that's what it is. He's, well, yeah. he's, he did like a drink as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not necessarily the best of uh, keeping his money to himself, but there's letters of him proving that he would send money home to his family and his parents. He's always, in any of the interviews you read with him, he was just a very compassionate person, it seems. Whenever he's meeting the interview, he's very kind to them, meets them down. And I think he was very generous with his money, giving his money back to the family and whoever he could support, basically. He didn't want to see people going without, I don't think. Mm hmm yeah, it, it's a uh, three hundred work. I yeah, I just think about that. I mean, that's all. He lived a while ago, but not that long ago. No. I mean, we're get we're getting to the era of photography at least. You know, during his lifetime, mm. and I just think about like it's what heartbreaking must have... to know that most yeah. of his works aren't played anymore. And that's one of the things I didn't really expect to find all of this when I started any of this project. I was just interested mm -hmm. in the one piece I was working on, and then I found mm -hmm. this, and I found that, and then he's got around thirteen operas, and then majority of his works are actually vocal work. It's mm -hmm. not actually music mm -hmm. for the double bass, but he is literally opera obsessed. And literally, if he's not doing opera, writing an opera, he'll be playing opera on the bass. That was just him. Wow, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's true, because you think about how many of his, his works are fantasies off of uh, operas. I was reading, um, as I was researching this, this goofy Bottazzini video I did a couple months ago, I was, I was, uh, I found it, uh, this Tom Martin, I think, I think did, I don't remember if he conducted or he had a hand in, in was it uh, Bottazzini's Requiem, mm -hmm. maybe, if I'm remembering this right? And he was just raving about the piece and how much it's he gorgeous. loved the piece. Have and, you listened to it? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. What what a what a what a fast well what a what a worthy project to get these out and and getting a, uh Urtex editions. That's how long I mean I've done like little projects that can kind of pale in comparison to this, but I'm always astonished at how long the work like you're doing takes. Yes. <laughs> and that's where I we want to see the project move into sort of a community type thing where we can all help each other out mm. because mm -hmm. well, obviously with around 300 works or what have you then it's almost impossible for one publisher to be able to manage that many. So I mm -hmm. want to try and develop the project so other people can help each other. That's my plan for the future. I want other people to try and get help involved because typing yeah. up and digitizing the music is going to take a very long time. And so a community to help the community. Yeah. Well, and we've got we've got ever better tools for doing stuff like that. So obviously, let me know if I can do anything to help and get the word That'd out. That's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major project, but that's that is the sort of thing that it would be great to have have the uh, the base community and people that are. Yeah, I've been really yeah, hoping I've like been that. Able to, that I could reach out to the ISB to be able to try and get some support behind this project, because ultimately I just want the bass players to have the resource so people can play his music. It's just it's something to be enjoyed and we're supposed to be doing together. You know, that's the whole underlying ambition behind it all when do you i'm I mean, always curious at how, how people work on because you do many things and I, <laughs> i'm assuming you're you're probably hanging around the house a little more than you would nor have thought that out be. though if i'm brutally honest trying to prepare materials because probably one of the things you found when you're doing that research project for the your little your bossini mm -hmm. video is that how mm -hmm. difficult it is to find a lot of information <gasps> You run out of stuff really fast. But there yeah, is absolutely. actually stuff out there, but it needs to be a group effort to try and get it collated into, and most of it's in Italian. That's the big problem. And that's one of the things I would hope that the community might be able to help with is to be able to translate materials to help give people more information to be able to study him and his music. All right, Italian bass students, if you're listening, <laughs> reach out to Stephen or, or myself or both of us. And uh, yeah, that's the, the yeah that, that's what I discovered. And that's what I've discovered looking up, uh, get it, trying to do some research on Von Hall or Sperger or people like that. And there's a lot out there about those people, but, you know, my German is pretty rough. Thank God for Google <laughs> Translate. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually did an interview, again, that I haven't put out yet. It's coming soon with the uh, James Barquette, who did the Alfred Planyavsky, the Baroque uh double bass violin or whatever the title is he did the english translation oh, of that book and, and yeah and it's a wonderful resource but i can count on one hand the the resources like that that are out there i think i have them all on my bookshelf mm. uh in english so it's it's sort of surprising and then I, I even go into the isb archives and start looking up and i i can find things scattered here or there that's where i found that tom martin Bottazzini requiem piece but mm. yeah it'd be great it'd be great to find a way to get some of this yeah uh, i'm hoping to try and bring it together so people can access it that's the whole ambition is to try and get people you know to access materials to learn beautiful that's great uh, I'm shifting gears yep. but it will probably come back to this again what uh what's what's <laughs> what, i have no structure to okay. these at all uh, are you all playing in the bournemouth symphony now are you doing concerts in some capacity or are you totally um, i've not been able to play or? since the 14th of march so i'm not actually a permanent member of the bournemouth symphony orchestra i flee at freelance okay. for sure Born Symphony, Royal Philharmonic, and what have you. Mm -hmm. So I haven't actually had any work since the 14th of March, 2020. Whew. So yep. things have been very challenging, should I say. And there's not been very much support from the government. But I'm trying to use this time as wisely as I can to try and get projects together, which I hope will benefit others in the future. I'm just trying to use the time yeah. wisely. That is a long chunk of time. Yeah, that, this is, I, I was talking to, uh, I, I also have not played bass since early March. I My bass is in the corner yeah. there. The last time it left, it left my flat was uh, March 6th seventh or yeah. eighth or something like that I, I played a bass quartet huh. in, here in san francisco we had this wonderful young bassist named xavier foley oh, uh, yeah yeah so we had him out as a guest mm -hmm. for this bass bash and it was that weird time when things were we weren't sure what was going on and so they had said uh no audience because it was just going to be an audience of kids yeah. and so they said
no kids, but you all can put it on and just play for a camera. Yeah. So poor Xavier flew six hours across the country to play for play for my my Canon camera, and <laughs> and and then I, we played an Andres Martin bass quartet, and that was the last time. And and the other folks in that bass quartet were all freelancers, are all freelancers here in the Bay, or, or were because there's no work now. And yeah, just talking to them about how they're coping, it's it's uh, yeah, it's, it's rough to not have a contract oh. for for sure. Yeah, definitely. It really is but as i said i've tried to just fill my time with other projects that i can yeah yeah and get, get outside it sounds yeah, like yeah i've been too. for a cycle ride today i got rained on funnily enough <laughs> okay <laughs> i have uh, i have a uh, um Fortunately, here in San Francisco, we have a mild climate, uh, so it's it, you know we're in winter, but I'm in a t-shirt. Yeah. So, uh, and, <laughs> and I tried to get out, get out and check email the beginning of every day on our balcony and just get a little sunshine and try to. It's gotta uh, look after this. Uh, you really do. And look yeah, after this. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. For for sure. For sure. Yeah. I've had my ups and downs, just like just like everybody. And I um, it's it's funny to I was they're not funny, tragic, but I was I was listening to a podcast that launched in like November 2019 and I, I was it is a music related podcast and it was like watching the first scenes of a disaster mm -hmm. movie because they're they're all talking about oh their plans for 2020 and all this and then all of a sudden like March hits and it's like special announcement and then it all is about so yeah I was doing ugh. Cabaret the musical uh, UK tour and I was mm -hmm. stepping in on that and then literally end of the show curtain down go home that's it you wow. know and that's that was wow. the last thing I did. <laughs> well, I was I was talking to a, a bassist here in the states named David White, who does a lot of theater work like that. I I saw him here in San Francisco. He was doing Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and connected with him, he lives in New York City. And you know, theater music is uh, yeah, nothing's happening on that. No, front. and it's a big thing in the UK. I'd ask, argue that musical theater is is one of our bigger employers in the music world, and the fact it just yeah. suddenly stopped very abruptly was very difficult to deal with. Well, and the nature of how uh, this is my impression from here across the pond but but the the nature of how people in 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 classical music jazz and and such in the uk how they work it seems to be a little bit more of a freelance nature yes. than maybe how it is in germany or and because it's interesting the the london classical scene you know there are all these different orchestras and people are playing a few different things but it really seems like people are so uh, a higher percentage of working professionals are are working as freelancers am i am i right you on are that? dead correct i mean i would say it's even lower as 20 or 30 percent of musicians here have a contract even less than that mm -hmm. maybe everybody is freelancing and just trying to do as many different things as possible to be able to make a living mm -hmm. it's quite a challenge but yes some people manage it this episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the features that perplexed me at first, and then I realized its brilliance, is their concept of flows. Here is Daniel Spreadbury, Senior Product Manager, on what flows are and how they work. The ability to have multiple exercises or multiple songs or whatever, you know, it's so obvious because music is very rarely just one through composed bit from right. start to end. You know, whether it's a show or a symphony or a sonata or a songbook or whatever music's in sections that's just how it works that is how it works but that's not how most music notation software works and the ability to break things up like that oh my goodness when i'm creating exercises or anything of the sort for my students or any sort of project that i have going that makes organization so much easier exporting is a breeze everything that you do in dorico is beautiful from the get-go which is really cool coming from other pieces of software check them out at dorico.com that'll take you to their site on steinberg's website and they have a free product called dorico se where you can do practically everything that you can in the full version of dorico for up to two parts that's more than enough if you're doing bass duets or anything of the like thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast dorico there are so many things to think about when you're practicing. Where do you even begin? Here is Modacity founder and CEO Mark Gelfo on what to prioritize in your practicing. First things first, you got to measure time. Time is of the essence. You want to get the highest return on your time investment. And the way to do that is through listening to yourself and self-recording. Almost everybody who reads the blogs, blogs of Rob Knopper, Noah Kagayama, everybody knows self-recording is absolutely essential. So we put it front and center along with time. Recording yourself, measuring the time you've spent on particular sections, and so many other things are available in Modacity. I love this app so much. You can learn more at modacity.co. And if you visit our website, we've got a special offer for lifetime access to the app. 
Check it out. You'll love it. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. Yeah, and I mean, we we certainly have a large percentage of people doing that here in the states, and and you know our our social net is not particularly great here in the mm. United States, and and so it's been really interesting. From interesting might be the wrong word, but seeing how people that do have contracts, how their organizations are taking care of them versus people who play for five or six different organizations, what's up with them? In general, it's not very good. The best way <laughs> to describe to the UK musicians are portfolio musicians. That's what they call them, and if I'm honest mm-hmm. majority of musicians in the uk make their money from teaching mm-hmm. well that's fortunately at least you can you can kind of sort of teach at the moment mm-hmm. the b- big shows you know not not likely to, to happen for for some time right. but I, how 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 i mean from an outside perspective it seems like you've been using the year well if if, if this is if this is what we're seeing so I, it's great to hear that you've you've found a way to to channel some energy into some projects that'll you know, have some sustainability. I've got a few big dreams. I mean, as soon as I can do in the future, I'd love to do some recordings. I really want to mm-hmm. hope that that happens in the future. But for now, I'm just going to try and continue producing these editions and what have you, and just trying to get resources out there for bass players to use. Yeah, a, a project I've been, I, I, I do like zero recording really, but, but the last f- three, four months, I decided we have this sheet music store that we got going and I, and I'm trying to make videos and I, and it occurred to me that might be a good one. Cause like someday I will play bass in public again. I know that will happen <laughs> right oh, now. So I have no, th- yeah, I have no, uh, there's no, you know, I've no, I have no tangible goals with bass. So that's been a good, uh, it's like learn a piece and my sense of pride means I need to learn it well enough to like not have people make fun of my wow. intonation. So it's, so I, I've tried to at least every couple weeks, learn something well enough that I can kind of put it out there in the public. And that has been remarkably good for my development because it's making me listen. And it's like, oh, my vibrato sounds terrible on that. Or, wow, I really can't play that in tune. Even Tangible after multiple goals. Takes. That's what it sounds like. You're yeah. chunking information and trying to be able to mm-hmm. build things that you can actually manage. Yeah, I totally agree. And in some ways, this situation where we have to record ourselves a lot gives right. us great sort of a magnifying glass onto things that we don't necessarily hear when we're just doing our normal motions. So in some ways, it can mm-hmm. be a real benefit for us, as you're saying, because you can hear things mm-hmm. you don't usually pick up. How, how are you organizing your your days since all of a sudden, like normally, if we go back in time, like a year, a, a year or year and year or 16 months or whatever, you probably had gigs and you're running from here and there and commuting and this and that. And then and then to have a whole bunch of open time, like like how are, are you setting a work schedule? for yourself or are you almost what are yes you doing? i have okay. a very long to-do list that i've been trying to get through i mean the thing that was on the top of my list was actually uh, an audition for the bbc and that they said oh it might happen it might happen i kept just keeping on top of them for as long as i could but that doesn't look like it's going to happen for any time soon so i've let that go by the wayside but the projects i've got on my to-do list i'm trying to i go in cycles if it makes sense mm-hmm. i'll work yeah, I have to have some balance with some other things, but I'll, I'll predominantly pick one thing and try and chisel away at that for a couple of weeks. Then I get to a point where if I try and force it, it's not going to work. So then it'll naturally mm-hmm. just sit there for a little bit longer and I'll jump on to the next one. So I was very lucky that when I was at music college, I learned with Simon Purcell a little bit and he, he, got, he brought these very useful tools into approaching improvisation that actually sort of apply to life. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I've been sort of in the back of my mind using that as a template to be able to work on and it's balancing what attracts you to something uh, and then versus something that really needs to be done and then you just keep going on cycles between the two sort of types of things yeah sure i that's interesting i think i work in kind of a similar way i have on my desktop like four kind of longer term projects and they get done when they get yeah, done that's right. and then i have things that they must be done this week like i have to get this this report in or i have a, I have a weird professional life so i have, to have and like 12 irons in the fire yeah. on different projects so so but but yeah i i work in a, a similar kind of way it sounds like yeah i don't like the amount of content and the amount of stuff that you've managed to bring together in two years is phenomenal i mean it is massively impressive so your methods must be working really really brilliantly i have to say well i i, I try i try to i try my, the i think the main thing that i try to do because because i've i've gone through different phases in my life where i've had a full-time job and then where i've been just freelancing and and the last actually since moving to san francisco five years ago i've i've kind of been the boss of my own time i i, w- I was doing some freelancing and then i realized oh wait uh i don't want to enter this freelance life again it's like it's like the same go around that i was having in chicago it's just very insecure generally i found particularly Earnings right. Well, I'm, I'm particularly glad now that this pandemic happened that I didn't go down that road because I, 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 and, and I 
I want it to be home more, I, you know, be able to have dinner with the wife and, and such. And so I just decided I was going to work from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, just like a normal office worker and do whatever the heck it is I do during that time. And, and that's kind of what that's been. That's been helpful for me because I just I'm looking at that clock and it's getting closer and closer to five. And it's like, oh, I got to stop. And so I think the, the no knowing that I have that constraint on myself has been helpful. And I used to not work that way. I used to like wake up at four in the morning and blog before yeah. going to work or I would be editing stuff at 9 p.m. And and I just had no boundaries. And I think those boundaries have helped. Oh, me. Definitely. I totally agree. There's a few books that I have loved to read. The Talent Code by Daniel yeah. Coyle. That's an amazing mm-hmm. book. And those sort mm-hmm. of things talk about having tangible. Uh, also, Kenny Werner's Effortless Mastery. That's another great book to, yeah. to read. Mm-hmm. And as you say, it's also giving yourself a, a self-respect thing. It's like, I am actually doing something that is going to benefit others. You know, it's going to work. I'm going to make sure I'm working like other people are nine to five if you like or have you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that i think motivates you as well because you're giving yourself enough self-respect to be able to carry on with your projects if that makes sense yeah no it totally makes sense and that kenny kenny with warner uh, effortless mastery what a great book i actually just heard him on a podcast i believe it was mind over finger my friend renee paul gautier and it was it was cool because i don't think i've heard it i don't know if he's done many podcasts or i don't think i've heard him i don't know if he puts himself out there like that but it was it's one of those books that i've known about for forever and it was just really cool to hear from him yeah well because the freelancer and a musician's life in general is very demanding especially when you're on stage and what have you and it gives you a very good structure to, to your mindset if that like if you like or, or methods mm-hmm. to be able to cope with difficult situations it's a very very important mm-hmm. book i think musicians should really it's very like cognitive behavioral therapy i think and a good mixture mm-hmm. of the two is great yeah it's 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 i've struggled throughout my life when i've been in more of that freelance uh work work uh phase of my life with uh yeah kind of like not taking myself seriously enough or respecting myself and I, and when i've had a full-time job or when i've been connected with an organization i'm a, i'm a very much of like a i like being part of a team and so one of the challenges with freelance for me was that i wasn't really part of a team and then i just kind of you know musician is not really uh uh, people don't you say doctor you say lawyer here in the states you say musician that's not not in the same (laughs) ballpark i know exactly what you're saying and sort of those other jobs give ratification for what you do from externally or if you're employed by someone you're you're ratified and that's quite a difficult thing i think we all have to challenge um, or deal with if we're freelancing is to be able to have that i am doing something that's worthwhile you know (laughs) Yeah. Well, I had I had seven years where I went and taught public school here in the in, in, in the States. And it was actually kind of fun to just say, you know, because before I would ha- someone would ask me what I do. Not that people are asking me what I do all the time, but like trying to explain music. You know, back when I was living in Chicago, what are, what do you do? I'm a, I'm a musician. Oh, what do you play? Bass. Oh, you play the Chicago Symphony? No, I don't. Uh, oh, wh- wh- why don't you? Yeah. It's like, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. And then you have a lengthy. Ex- so do you make money doing that? And it was so nice nice to just say I teach high school and everybody understands that they said I went to high school I had teachers I know exactly what you do nice to meet you too and the, and then to have like a steady paycheck and all of a sudden I could I could get a car loan I could get I, I could I could before I, here in the United States having to explain my income you know you it's a, you have these very suspicious looking <laughs> income streams to any institution so yeah. getting getting a house getting a loan get, get you know all that stuff all those things really, are very really much dreams gotcha. for me if I'm honest <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but yes, for those very reasons, yeah. Well, it'll be really cool to see how the, what you're doing on the publishing front uh, evolves and like what that looks like. Because it's it's you probably don't know what this is going to look like. It'll be interesting to go to five years from now, look back to right now, beginning of 2021. Mm-hmm. And you know, if if you keep that work ethic up and you keep putting things out and getting these projects together, some some of the greatest things in life, at least in my life, have been really long term projects. Like I set the I sowed the seeds. Is that the right term? Yeah, that's like right. ten years ago 10 years ago now they're happening and so it's yeah i agree it's the same i've always tried to the motto i've always had to be employable as possible if that makes sense and i've always Mm -hmm. tried to see this coming in the future so i thought that right could do a bit of publishing bit of teaching bit of freelance playing a bit of this Mm -hmm. that and trying to have my income as multiple different sources it's Mm -hmm. a lot more challenging than we ever thought it would be but i just hope that these areas grow as and they can help (laughs) you know 
Well, and the, the thing that I, I sort of, uh, that's a little bit of comfort to me, if we look at any other pandemic in history, generally there is a flourishing of the arts and people, like I would not buy stock in Zoom right now. <laughs> people are probably getting sick of hearing me say this on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. because the moment we don't have to do this, that we're not going to, and, and I, I, you know, I used to do a lot of remote interviews and it's a great way for us to connect like this. It's so convenient. But I had been going in the direction of never doing remote interviews and only doing in person. And, and, and so what I'd started to do was go on trips. And, and so I went two weeks in Australia and just talked to Australians. Okay. I went to New York City and I thought, I, I, and I will again once we get going again, but I thought one week a year, I'm just going to go to New York City because I could go to New York City. Uh, I could go to talk to somebody different every day, every hour of every day and never run out of people. Everybody you meet knows something you don't. So that's my yes. motto. Meet as many people as you can and you have as rich life as possible. Yeah, but I mean, I know that as soon as as soon as we can, I'm going to be going. I I I'm a concert goer. I like going and seeing concerts, but I am going to every concert there is. And I think <laughs> as soon as we get out of this, because I I am so sick of sitting at home. Yeah, because everything you do has to go through the computer if it makes sense, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that can get a bit much. So I completely sympathise. I, I I want to obviously be back to playing, back to seeing concerts, back to just being with other people and being creative with other people in in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be like absolutely yes. if you came over i'd love to come we can go for a beer that'd be great well i i'm a hundred percent will be in the uk like that that's that was one of those places that i like i felt i i just had this traveling schedule that was impossible last year where i was i had to be at a conference here in the states and then i had another one i had just enough time to fly to leeds and come back and because otherwise yeah I, I and it's it's a long enough flight like from the west coast you know we're back in the i used to live in chicago which is closer to the east coast london's not bad that's not a bad flight really you know um but you add the five or six hours it takes to get across this stinking country yeah. <laughs> and and it's not direct so it's like fly to you know the east coast then fly again mm -hmm. and i think i flew san francisco Francisco, Philadelphia, then uh, Ireland, yeah. and oh, then crikey. Leeds or yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. I've never had the chance to come to America, though, so I really look forward to that one day. I know there's a wealth of... Well, I, I'd, love, I'd love to see you out here, but my, my, you, you, if you got to pick a place with your interest, you got to go to oh, New York City oh, well, because <laughs> yeah, it, it's the only... As, a, as someone who's into jazz, I mean, it really is... It's like watching a... Um, it's like something out of a movie. I mean, it really, like the East Village and walking around, it's, it's the only 24-hour town we've got here in this country. Like I, I, There was an International Society of Basis Convention four years ago, mm -hmm. I think was this the one. It was in upstate New York. And I had a layover. I, I got to just outside of Manhattan, uh, the airport, and I at like 10 p.m. And my next flight was 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something. So I just threw my backpack on, hopped in an Uber, and I just wandered Manhattan yeah. all night. I, I was eating Korean food <laughs> at 2 in the morning, and I was seeing music. And I mean, the, this town I live in here, it's a big city, but it shuts down by 11 p.m. There's almost nothing. I'd say London has a similar vibe to that, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. You can still get your Korean mm -hmm. food at 2 a.m. in the morning. Don't worry. <laughs> There's lots yeah. of kebab shops yeah. as well. So, yeah, I look forward to doing the same. Yeah. Let me know again. Let me know what I can do to, to help and get the word out about about this or or anything. I'm always I'm always available. That'll be great. Yeah, I've, I've wanted to have a chance to speak to you for a very long time. So, yes, yeah, anything we can do in collaboration with the ISP, it'd be great to be able to approach some institutions as well that may want to be able to help us with access to manuscripts and what have you. That would be fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Well, we'll start with the, getting this podcast out and I'll obviously link up to your site and the editions and great, and all that kind of kind of good stuff. So Thank I appreciate so it. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's great. Great to meet you. Let's 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 chat again. I love doing a round two and a round three with I'll people and in person with a, a with a coffee or a beer. <laughs> even <laughs> even even better. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Although I have got alcohol, but yeah, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs>Stephen, thank you so much. StephenStreet.com is the website. Check it out. He's got a great website, by the way. And these publications are there. And like I mentioned in the intro, we've got some of his publications coming into our Double Base Block ecosystem. But whether you go to his website and get it directly from him or through us or whatever, he's doing good work. Uh, super cool person. And the first of many conversations, I'm sure. And by the way, I have this awesome Bottazzini coffee mug that Stephen sent me. And you can get that on the website, too, I believe. I'm clicking around here. Uh, 
uh, and that is very fun to check. Yeah, Vodazine merchandise. There it is right on the website. You can get uh, heavyweight t-shirts. You can get hoodies. You can get Vodazine poster. This mug is is pretty sweet. Got a couple designs for that. So very cool. I got to I gotta remember to use that in one of my upcoming videos. I've got it sitting there. I use it, and I just ha I usually don't drink coffee while I'm shooting my videos, but I've got to, well, I do, but not on camera. Uh, so I got to got to make that happen sometime soon. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Leon. Thank you for listening. If you ever want to suggest a guest or just reach out and say hi, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com will get you in touch with me. I respond to each and every message, even if it takes me a few days <laughs> to get to get back to folks. And yeah, this podcast is, you know, this might be the longest thing I've done. No, it's not quite. I'm, I'm, I'm closing in on this being the longest activity I've done continuously in my life. I think that playing in the Elgin Symphony still holds that record. I think I've done that. I did that for 16 seasons. And this podcast is what, 14 years or something like that. So it will surpass Elgin unless I quit doing the podcast. Um, but it's been interesting having this as a through line for, for before going to back to school to be an orchestra teacher while I was an orchestra teacher. And I kind of let this podcast lapse trying to figure out what the heck to do with my, with my life when I found out we were moving out to California, resurrecting this kind of podcast 2.0, almost another podcast really uh, than the first one back in 2015, focusing on this, getting busy with other projects, building a team, which has been awesome. And yeah, it's, just, it's a crazy journey. This sheet music store, I, will be, I, have, I have slightly more time for these outros than I usually do. I'm doing them on a Thursday, and I seem to have been right down to the wire the last few weeks. So um, I'll share a little bit more about my life. Uh, the, the sheet music store that we put out a couple months ago at this point, three months ago, has been surpassing my expectations. And and I, nobody is is uh, making a full-time living off this sheet music store, nor do I anticipate people will be at any point soon, any of the composers or or certainly uh, me or Trevor working on the, uh, the background on this. But boy, it is really cool to see people connecting with this and picking up titles. And it's, uh, it's just, it's something, I mean, I guess I wasn't expecting it not to work. But it's exceeded my expectations, and it's just another aspect of the bass community that uh, we have built here. Uh, especially those of you who've been on this journey for a while, it's it's uh, it's really cool, and it's cool to see that manifest itself as something that is actually benefiting people in the bass community. And actually, it's benefiting the people who purchase the music, and obviously benefiting the composers. So, thank you, Trevor Jones. Thank you, uh, actually. Um, Boy, that that was an idea that got started by Michael Kurth in the Atlanta Symphony. He suggested this sheet music store, really just a a, a resource to to well, well, yeah, what eventually became a sheet music store. And and it's we had it all. It was just this free library, and then we realized as as more and more titles started to get added, that that oh, there's some potential here to actually uh, turn it into a. Uh, financial thing. So anyway, that's been cool. If you haven't checked it out, you can go to doublebaseblog.org slash music and that will take you there. And we're, as I record this, we're at over 125 titles and we've got like a big old bunch of other uh, titles from some fairly well-known people in the bass world coming on board soon. So uh, yeah, I think it's pretty cool and not my idea at all, but it's just one of the cool things about the community aspect of all this and having people involved. Uh, yes. Okay. No edits on this one, Jason. So let's get out of here and thank the team who put these together. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas, Fort Worth area, Kilgore, Texas, just a little bit east of DFW. Check them out at MitchMooring.com, award-winning bases. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm.